Okie doke. So uh, welcome, everybody. Um, part of the reason for these weekly meetings, or the main reason, is really to address any issues you might be having throughout the week. Also to kind of keep you on, on task, um, because it's easy to just wait until the last day to um, just then try and pull a marathon and watch 46 hours and of, of stuff in 24 hours. So such as life as a student. So um, anyway, uh, I wanted to remind everybody that if you could email me your, your physical mailing address, then I can send you a paper copy of the textbook, but I've got to have your, your mailing address and you can email that to J, J A Y at blue rock station dot com and if you just email me your mailing address i'll get that um, i'm traveling this week so it'll probably go out next week um next monday but uh i in the meantime we'll get that underway all of you should ideally at this point have access to e uh, to electronic versions of the textbook so um if you don't go ahead and email me um, and I'll send you the link. I've included the link in some of these weekly reminders as well, just, just to make everybody clear on that. And then speaking of the weekly reminders about which chapters we should be, where we should be in the system, you'll see in that reminder, there are links to videos that have been uploaded. Um, some of the, I'll upload the links from this session, for example, for next week's reminder. But I did go ahead and hold and keep in there links from previous classes, you know, where we've run these same sessions. So if, you know, somebody asks a question there that's not asked this time, that might be helpful. And then there's also links to end of chapter review videos um, in case you're, you have questions. You get to the end of the chapter and you're doing the quiz and you just don't understand why you're getting something wrong. Uh, those end of the chapter videos are there linked as well. So all of that in theory is is there to help you proceed through. So far in, in the course, you're really only through chapter three at this point. Um, it's all pretty basic stuff. Uh, hopefully you're not running into any um, complication. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, once we get into chapter five, chapter seven, those can become a bit complex. So um, if you're if you're thinking this is moving along too easy, it's going to get more difficult. So I'll just fair warn. I don't think any of the component bits are difficult, but that just gets to be a lot of stuff um, and and you a lot of things to remember. Uh, I also wanted to remind everybody of the dates of our face to face. So as part of the uh, ETA certification process. There are three components. There's 40 hours of training. This online session meets that component piece. Uh, the, the online training has been approved for that. Then there are hands-on labs that are record, required. So we'll be doing those during our face-to-face -face sessions. And then you've got to pass the certification examination that's developed by ETA. And we'll do that during the face-to-face -face, um, meeting as well. So when we get together for those two days, um, the first day we'll do hands-on labs. We'll get all of that done. Then the second day we will um, do review. So we'll try and walk through the entire class. We'll review as long as you feel is necessary, but usually it's two hours, maybe three hours of review. And then we'll go ahead and take the uh, certification exam. So that just gives you a sense of what's going to happen during the face-to-face -face, um, meetings. And uh, you have to get a 75% on the certification exam in order to pass uh, the certification. If you don't, if you do not get 75%, you have the opportunity for one free retake. Um, that You have to wait a period of 30 days before you can do the retake. And there is online proctoring available for that. So, um, you know, if if you uh, just simply are overwhelmed by it, uh, bad at taking tests, whatever, uh, you can catch up on that and take the uh, take the exam a second time. If you fail it two times, if you want to retake it a third time, 
then you're going to have to pay the $155 uh, that's part of the certification process to retake it a third time. And, and uh, the $155 that goes to ETA is built into the, the fee for this class. So uh, the face-to-face -face dates, just to remind you, if you're with the Marietta class, that's September 23rd and 24th. Then the West Virginia group at Eastern West Virginia Community College, that's going to be at the 28th and the 29th. I think that's a Thursday and a Friday. And then Hiram, October 7th and 8th. So those are the dates that you should hopefully have on your schedule for those face-to-face. -face. If for some reason, let's say you're enrolled in the, you know, the Marietta class or whatever, and those dates you get a conflict comes up, you could come to one of those other sessions and uh, go ahead and participate there. So it gives you that flexibility. It's not ideal and probably a bit of a drive, but, uh, but you could do that. So just let me know if that becomes an issue. Um, okay, so any questions on the process of what we're doing at this point? Just give you a second for that. If you do have a question that comes up, just email me. Again, j at blueroxstation.com. Uh, or you can give me a call, and that number is in all of the documentation. Um, okay, so any questions that have occurred to you as you're reviewing? Um, we're really focusing here on chapters one through three. Uh, if you've got a question beyond that, that's fine. I can address it, but uh, uh, you may leave some folks behind. So anything come up in your studying of these first three chapters? that anybody has a question or a concern. Hopefully you've you've moved forward. If you hold this stuff too long, you're gonna be in trouble uh, just because there's too much to absorb. Okay, so anticipating that everybody knows everything, I thought what I would do is just focus on what I think is of the first three chapters maybe the most confusing. So I'll touch on that real quickly, but uh, then if nobody has any additional questions, let y'all go, there's no reason to hang on just to fill up the hour. Um, but I wanted to talk about the different types of systems. So really this is chapter three. Um, the, the major types of systems that are out there in photovoltaic, most people when they're thinking of PV, they think of standalone systems. They think about like, I'm gonna quit my job, I'm gonna buy some goats, I'm gonna go move out into the, you know, buy a cabin in the woods and I'm gonna, um, you know, sit out life and be independent of the grid. And that's what most people think of with solar. And that is such a small minority of the systems that are actually installed. Probably two or 3% of what we install is gonna be a standalone system. Most of the systems that are installed are what they refer to as grid tie. And grid tied assumes you have access to the electrical grid, but you link into it uh, and your solar is used just simply to offset some of the electricity that you're using. Um, so during the day when you're generating power, uh, you'll use the power first from your solar array because energy electricity always flows the past of least resistance so wherever the closest load is to the generating system, that's where it's gonna be consumed. So uh, solar panels are on your roof, you turn on lights, you turn on your refrigerator, whatever. Power from the solar is going to come and flow into those appliances first. If you're generating more power than you need, the grid then becomes a load. It becomes the path of least resistance. So that extra power will flow onto the grid, uh, referred to often as net metering, um, where you are then compensated in some form or fashion for the power that is flowing out onto the grid. Um, normally, the utility has to install a bi-directional meter that accounts for this. And in the good old days of solar, your electricity would simply, you'd use what you did, it runs through your meter, the meter flows backwards, just like taking miles off your odometer, and you get full retail credit for what you're producing. You know, instead of 
using power, you're saving there, but then when you flow it backwards, you get full retail credit. And those were the early days of net metering. Today, the utilities are typically um, fighting back. They don't like that. They're basically saying, I'm in the business of selling power. Why am I paying retail for these people to produce power back onto the grid? Well, you know, when it was 1%, when it was half a percent of their customer base, they just didn't even pay it any attention. But there's a great quote from Gandhi. It's like, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they attack you, and then you win, you know? So what's happening is we're in attack mode. You know, for a while they they ignored and then they made fun of these Prius driving, tree hugging solar people. And now they see that solar is an existential threat to their business model. And so they are attacked. And so most of the utilities now, they try and say you can't even send it back. But the state legislatures have, have typically put in net metering laws. But typically the situation now is you buy power from them retail and they will pay you wholesale for whatever you send back. So if you're paying 20 cents a kilowatt hour, which is not unusual in today's market, the utility might pay you four cents a kilowatt hour for what you send back. Um, well, then a lot of folks are going, okay, well, what's the point? You know, I'm not being fairly compensated for that. Um, another issue is that if the grid goes down, your grid tied system turns off, you know, and, and customers will also often say, what are you talking about? My, my solar is not producing, the grid is down. That's why I put this on here. I wanted power when the grid goes down so I can have lights and all my neighbors are in the dark and I'm, you know, showing off to them or whatever. But because your system pumps power back onto the grid when you're overproducing. It's referred to as anti-islanding, where the inverter shuts down so that you're not putting live electricity onto lines that the workers assume are dead. So you could, you could literally kill uh, a, an electric lineman out there if your system is generating power when the power when the grid is down. So all of our inverter systems are designed to simply shut off when it loses sight of the grid, when the grid is not active anymore. So then there's a third solution here where they refer to it as a um, grid interactive system, or more typically in today's terms, you would hear AC coupled or DC coupled system. And what this is designed to do is when the grid is working, it acts like a grid tied system. You know, you're, you're, you produce power, you use it. If you have too much power, you send it to the grid. If you need power, you pull it from the grid. All right. That's typically how, you, how it will work when the grid is working. But if the grid goes down, there's what's called an auto transformer or an auto disconnect. And it will disconnect your system from the grid. And then it will act like a standalone system. Okay, so that would be referred to as either an AC coupled system or a DC coupled system. And that's kind of the best of both worlds because you're offsetting some of your power needs, um, but you're not having to invest as much as is required in a full standalone system. Now, in the residential marketplace, there are really two major companies that um, are the dominant players. And since this class is really focused on residential, the two major companies are gonna be Solar Edge and Enphase. And they actually make up about 80% of all of the residential systems in the United States that are installed today. During our labs, we'll work with both a Solar Edge system and an Enphase system. But these are the two dominant ones. The end phase is what's referred to as a microinverter system. And the microinverter system is basically a tiny inverter that's attached to every single pan. Um, so uh, to just give you a little bit of background on how this evolved, back in 2014, 
Um, the NEC, the National Electrical Code, these are all, you know, white male middle-aged guys who meet at places like Honolulu and Jackson Hole, Missouri, and places like that. And they get together and they set the rules. And it is designed, it is based on safety. What is safe as far as the use of electricity? Well, in 2014, they basically said, all right, we want these systems to shut down. Um, well, they already, we already had auto um, um, anti-island. So the inverter would shut down um, when the grid goes down. But the issue was that typically a system at that time, the solar panels would be on the roof, the inverter would be down in the basement. And all of the power lines that go from the roof down to the basement, the, the inverter shuts off. But if the sun is shining, those lines are still live, going all the way down to the inverter. And if a fireman shows up at the building, and the first thing they do, typically, if the house is on fire, is they pull the meter. They just remove the meter, and that disconnects the building from the electrical grid. At that point, they assume there is no electricity in the building. Unknown to them, there could be 600 volt live electricity flowing from the roof to the basement. So they get up onto the roof and with their chainsaws, they start cutting through the roof to vent some of the smoke out of the building and they could cut through a live electric line. So the NEC said, all right, when they disconnect from the grid, we want all the power to turn off at the solar panel, not at the inverter. And the industry at that time, and I remember it because I was involved, uh, they go, how do we do that? How? What technology will we use? And the National Electrical Code said, we don't care. That's your problem. Because um, they really don't care. They don't care if it's possible. They don't care if it costs you a lot of money or whatever. That's yours to figure out. So the first thing, if it's a large commercial property like a Walmart or something, well, that's quite easy. You just simply take your inverter and locate it right next to your solar array. Just put it on the roof, right? So when the grid goes down, boom, no, no live lines in the building. Not a problem. But that's not very practical for a regular residential home. So then a company, Enphase, said, you know what, why not, instead of having one big inverter, why don't we make little tiny inverters that are only big enough to handle the power output of one solar panel, and we'll simply just attach each panel to those microinverters. And uh, so that's they, that was their product, that was their solution. And, and it was very expensive. Right, because instead of having one two thousand dollar inverter, you had thirty three hundred dollar inverters. You know, so that was a pretty pricey solution. Um, but then they discovered, you know what? Now each panel operates independent of every other panel. So if I had a shading issue or a problem, I I I've got independent you know, maximization of every single one of these panels. Um, in a string inverter, if one panel is shaded, it affects every panel in that string. Here, each one is operating independently. They also found that you could put a communication device in these and you can begin to monitor every single panel. How much is this one producing? Is it producing? Is there a problem? So you created this. So they began to find there were additional advantages to having one electronic device on each of these panels. So then another company, Solar Edge, which is an Israeli company, came out and they said, you know what we could do is we could put that automatic shutdown in the electronic component. We could put the communication device in there. We could put the maximum PowerPoint tracking so that each one acts independently, but we don't have to put the inverter. You know, we're going to put everything else except converting everything from DC to AC. Because remember, solar panels generate power in DC, but we use power in AC. So that's what the inverter does. So 
Um, so they said, we can do that. We can build these little power optimizers is what they called them and meet the requirement of the NEC. But instead of charging $300 for each of these units, we can charge like $75. And, and now it becomes a thing. Then you just have a, a cheaper fixed inverter, you know, string inverter, and it attaches to the optimizers. So that became Solar Edge's model. Well, then of course, people began to adopt these two technologies. They were competing technologies, but the microinverters, where every panel is now generating AC electricity, and for a residential home, that's typically gonna be 240 volt AC electricity, or you've got an, um, uh, solar edge, where every single panel is now producing 400 volt DC electricity, and it goes to a string inverter and it's converted to AC. So that became the two. And then of course, as they became more, um, you know, with, with widespread adoption, the prices started coming down. And so the uh, microinverters no longer cost $300. They ended up costing about $125, $150 a piece. The optimizers now cost in the neighborhood of $40 a piece. So these the the prices have come down pretty dramatically, but because of the advantages that they offer, they became the dominant technologies in residential systems. So that's kind of the history about how we got Enphase, which is an American product, um, American company. They became the dominant microinverter company, and then Solar Edge, which is an Israeli company, became the dominant in um, uh, power optimization. So those are the two main systems in residential. Then when we began to see people um, saying, you know what, I would like to have power when the grid goes down, um, Solar Edge became very popular because it's a DC coupled system and the DC power, they could, they could incorporate a battery, right? Because it's DC to DC. Batteries are DC. Photovoltaics are DC, so you could create a DC coupled system. Just like a generator, all you need is an auto disconnect. Um, and in fact, I've got a little video. I'll show you videos on on both of them. They're like three minute videos. But um, so so Solar Edge actually became much more popular um, because you could take DC power from the panels, and you could then take that down to an inverter but you could also hook a DC battery to that. And all you needed to do is have an auto disconnect in there so that when the grid goes down, you simply disconnect from the grid and then you redirect power from your array and your batteries to critical loads. So in both of these systems, you typically need what's referred to as a critical load panel or a sub panel, because you don't wanna really have to invest in a system that covers all of your loads. Um, if you think about your own home, what do you really need when there's a power outage? Um, we just set up one in our office building. And so we just said, all right, all we really need, the refrigerator and the freezer, be nice if that didn't go out. Um, the electronic controls and blower fan for the, for the furnace, so that if it's in the winter time, we have heat because it's a gas furnace. And we also figured our office with all of the communication devices, the modem, you know, so that we have communications and we have some outlets. And then we also put in the sump pump. So in case the power is out because we have a storm emergency where there could be flooding, I'd, I'd like the basement not to flood. So, so those became our critical loads. The rest you can live without. At least I decided I could live without for a period of time, whether it's a day, a month, an hour whatever, could live without it. Might end up running a lot of extension cords or whatever, but I can still live without it. Um, but if I wanted to back up everything in the home, I would have to pay a lot more for my systems. I'd have to put in bigger batteries and things like that. Um, the downside with Enphase is because everything was coming out of the solar panels as AC, we would just say, no, you know what? If you want battery backup, can't have it because we've got AC power coming out of the, the panels. You can't charge a DC battery, you know? It's not gonna be, integrate. 
Well, about two or three years ago, Enphase came out with a with a system that incorporates batteries with their Enphase um, units. And this is an AC coupled system. And the way they did it is the battery banks basically have a bunch of little microinverters integrated into the battery. So the DC power comes out of the battery, it's converted to AC at the battery and then flows into the system. So it's AC and AC. Well, you could see that that could be very inefficient because every time you convert from DC to AC or from AC to DC, you lose some of the power. There's an inefficiency in that process. Well, with an AC coupled system, I'm taking DC power from the uh, panels, converting it to AC. Then I go and I want to put it into the battery. Well, I've got to convert it from AC to DC to put it into the battery. And then if I want to take it out of the battery, I've got to take it from DC to AC. So you actually have three conversions going on with three losses of energy that, that are happening in this process. Well, that used to be a deal killer because these microinverters, when they first came out, were only about 90% efficient. So you would lose about 10% of your power, you know, when you went from AC to DC. So in that situation, we'd lose 30% of our power just doing AC coupled. Today, the inverters are more like 98 to 99% efficient. So now during each of these conversions, we're only losing one and a half percent. So, okay, it goes through three of them. Well, you're still only going to lose 5%, you know, in the whole conversion, which is acceptable. It's not ideal, but it's acceptable. Um, so that's, that's why now Enphase and their AC coupled system is commercially viable. Solar Edge, a DC coupled system, you're going from DC power at the at the array. It goes down and charges a DC battery, right? And then it goes into your inverter, and all that has to happen is there's only one conversion from DC to AC. So it's going from DC to the load, whether it's coming through your solar panel or from your battery. So much more efficient kind of uh conceptually. So typically what I would say is if you're going to design your system from scratch, most people are going to lean towards the DC coupled system if they want battery back. That's something that they're going to look at. Um, if you already have an end phase system, well, then you're going to have to have an AC coupled system because you're not going to throw all that away just because you want to add batteries. All right, so that's where we've gone to this point, but then it's going to get more complicated because um, now people are looking at, instead of me going out and buying a big battery system, can't I use the batteries that are in my electric vehicle and use that as the battery system for my home? And this is something that's just now becoming viable. I mean, you've got a battery bank in your car. So if you're going to spend $30,000 on batteries, why not drive it? You know, so so now we're looking at um, the first one that's really marketing them, them themselves this way is the Ford Lightning, where, you know, the Ford Lightning is an electric pickup truck, basically the F-150. And it has about 130 kilowatt hour battery. Just to give you a sense how big that is. Tesla power walls are 13 kilowatt hours. So the Ford Lightning is like having 10 of these Tesla power walls. Each of those power walls costs about $8,000. So you've got $80,000 worth of batteries in this Ford F-150. So um, it's enough power in that battery bank to essentially run a home for, um, seven days, you know, a typical residential home uh, without having any soul. So this is the direction we're moving into, where your charging station, you plug your vehicle into the, into the car, the battery is now connected, and now it's there to back up your, your home. 
That's where we're going. Unfortunately, a lot of the companies are marketing it that we're already there, but they're not, they don't have the product to support it. They're, it's, it's vaporware at this moment. And you can get yourself into some trouble, as I did, where Enphase announced they're working with a company called uh, uh, Clipper Creek for Enphase compatible charger stations for your electric vehicles. So my immediate thought is, oh, Enphase compatible, therefore it must be bi-directional. It must allow me not only to charge the vehicle, but to use the battery as my battery back. Well, after I bought all of the bits, turns out none of that is true. Um, it allows you to charge your vehicle, but not to use your vehicle battery. And so what I was telling the guys at Enphase, but every, every charge controller is Enphase compatible because it generates AC electricity. If you're charging a vehicle, it's using AC electricity. They're like, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, good. You just sold me a $600 charging station. That So anyway, I needed one anyway, but that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, I also just saw that that Solar Edge is marketing the same thing um, with, with uh, their charging station. And their charging station is not bi-directional either, but you can get into um, some programs. So it's kind of interesting where you can use, you can set all of the information within your solar array to um, determine when you want to charge. So instead of sending power back to the grid and getting paid wholesale, why not time it so that when you have excess power available from your array, use that to charge your battery in your car. Don't just charge it until it's full charge it when you have the power available to charge it so that you're using wholesale cost electricity instead of retail cost electricity to charge your vehicle. Um, there's also a lot of time of day, uh, time of use pricing now with electricity. So in, most of us, I think, are in situations where we simply pay one standard price for um, electricity, regardless of what time we use it. So if I use it at two in the morning or two in the afternoon, they're just charging me 18 cents a kilowatt hour or whatever. But the utilities are moving to time of use pricing. So uh, oftentimes that starts where you have low demand period, moderate, and then high demand. And so during low demand periods, they might charge you say eight cents a kilowatt hour, then moderate, they'll charge you 18 cents. And then high demand, they might charge you 40 cents a kilowatt hour. And they're trying to change how you're using electricity. Um, in Hawaii, for example, I know during high demand, they can charge as much as 70 cents a kilowatt hour. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's coming. And in California, they just passed a law that it's not going to be a three-tier system. It's going to be like analog. Uh, the pricing will change second to second, moment to moment, based on how much demand there is on the grid. So there's no way that you could ever manually or in your brain figure out what the cost of electricity would be. It has to be computer monitored. And, and that's what these systems are beginning to do, um, is monitor when the power is available, how much it's costing, and then redirect where you're drawing your power from. So uh, these computer systems are these uh, solar systems are becoming very complicated, um, much more complicated to install. And then when you throw on top of that, Enphase has just come out with a system they call uh, sunlight backup, where the new microinverters don't even require a battery. If the sun is shining, they will produce electricity as long as you're disconnected from the grid using their system. like So you can do an AC coupled system with no battery, and but it only will function when the sunlight is, when the sun is shining. Uh, when the sun goes away at nighttime, you don't have any power. Um, so there are uses for that. But, um, but then think what that means. The sun doesn't shine evenly all the time. So if you have loads that are being 
powered by sun and a cloud comes across the array, well, now some of those loads won't operate because there's not enough power to operate all the loads. So now you have to integrate a load management system that will take each one of these loads and prioritize it and say, all right, when there's enough power to run them all, we'll run them all. But when there's not enough power, we're going to cut them off in this sequence. You know, that load goes away first, then this load goes away, and then that load goes away. And, and all of that is doable, but all of that requires a little bit more um, complication when you go to install the system. So, uh, so anyway, these are, these are the way, this is how we're moving in the world of uh, residential solar. Uh, I, I find it it's interesting where you can go and install a system in a day and then it'll take you like two days to do all the computer programming to get everything to work, you know? So, so we're moving into that realm where commissioning the system becomes the, the major hurdle in, in the installation process. All right, any questions on what I've, what I've talked about to this point? Have I confused you all? Hopefully not. Anything give you that? I'm going to um, see if I can really quick uh, show you a couple of these. All right. Uh, are you seeing the video screen there uh, with the with video? Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'll talk over this as they go. Um, are you guys seeing full screen now? Okay. So what, what he's pointing to here, this is an end phase system, and these are three of the batteries. I'm gonna actually turn down this volume so I'm not competing with him. Um, okay, so there are three of these battery systems, and you can see the microinverters in the top two. He's taken the front casing off of that. So you've got batteries with microinverters, and there's also disconnect switches and controls and things of that nature. So don't think of a battery in a solar as just a battery. There's usually controllers. In this case, there are inverters built into it. So these systems now are proprietary. I cannot use anybody else's battery with an end-phase system. I have to use an end-phase battery system. Um, we, we sort of went through this where everybody had components that were interchangeable, and now we're moving back to system system solutions where every piece has to communicate properly with the other pieces. So therefore they found it's it's not only more profitable, <laughs> but the systems work better if they're designed to work together from the beginning. Now he's gone outside and this is the auto disconnect unit. That unit there actually weighs about 80 pounds. It's a little bit uh, misleading. It's it's quite a thing to install. Um, and what that is, is your solar comes into it, your batteries come into it, you can hook up a generator in there, and that is the auto transformer. That's where the grid is connected and it says, all right, is the grid available? Now I'm gonna feed out to sub panel and main panel. But if the grid goes down, I'm going to disconnect from the main panel and I'm just going to feed power to the sub panel. And I'm going to begin to draw power from the batteries. I'm going to begin to draw power from a generator if it's necessary. The unit that's to the left of that is the combiner box. And that's where all the different strings of um, the branch circuits from the array at the top of the roof, in this case, feed into that in phase. Um, uh, combiner box. That can take up to four branch circuits, or basically, uh, I think you could put about 11 panels with the IQ8s. So that could have about 44 panels connected to one of those boxes. If you've got a bigger system than that, you're going to need two of those combiner boxes. And in that combiner box is the communication device. Not the one he's looking at there, but the little box to the left. This unit here, this is has an auto transformer, he's sort of pointing to the top there, or um, which generates a neutral so that it operates both at 240 and 120 um, when the grid is down. Um, 
so now he's back in here with his with his boxes in it. So you can see there's a lot of different component pieces. These battery units there weigh about 200 pounds. So each of those is is mounted on the wall. Uh, it took a couple of you know two men and a boy to heft those things up and mount those things. So you better make sure you've got um, adequate support for these things. He's telling you how nice it is because there's not as much stuff as is required with other with other systems, but it's still quite a lot of stuff. Um, and each one of these devices has a Bluetooth communication unit that communicates in the combiner box with all the other devices. So there is a, communi a communications device in that combiner box that is sending out Bluetooth signals to coordinate between the batteries, the array, the combine, or the auto disconnect. So all of these things are communicating with each other. And another thing that I find that Enphase requires, which I find quite annoying, is your system's communication system connects in with your Wi-Fi um, at your house, but they require that you also install a cellular modem into this because their argument is your Wi-Fi might go out, but we still want this system communicating. So they require you to buy a $550 unit that you stick in there just as a backup. And... I argued with them saying, listen, I'm not that concerned about my data. You know, if I lose my data, so what? I'd rather keep my $550. But uh, they're not really keen on that. And my guess is it's because they were getting a lot of uh, service call questions. So it makes their life easier if they just simply require it. So I, I probably sound way too cynical on this. Um, Okay, so let me let me find, I want to show you the other video here. Yeah. So this one here is the um, end phase. And, or not the end phase, this is the solar edge system. So just to give you a sense of the components, they go into a, a whole bit here about how how your system will will um, produce but how you use it. So having battery backup allows you to, you know, service your loads in the morning, in the evening, and not send it back. That's referred to as self-consumption. Um, if you, you because, and this is becoming a thing because the utilities are making it difficult or making it not very profitable to send power back to them. They're charging you 20 cents, paying you four, I'm going to try and set this thing up to keep and use as much of the power as I'm generating as possible. Uh, another issue is we've we've seen a lot of major grid outages. In California, they had the wildfires that knocked out the grid for a period of months. In Texas, they had the winter storms that knocked out the grid for a period of weeks. And in uh, Puerto Rico, they had the hurricane that knocked out the power grid for months and months and months, almost a year. Um, so in all three of those locations, more than 50% of all of the systems now include some sort of battery backup. And in my studying of the grid, the grid is so fragile at the moment, we've had several cases where we've come within an eyelash of having large parts of the United States be without power for months, I mean, literally months. It's hard to imagine. Uh, you think that a system, um, for instance, if you get a big cold wave that comes through, like the December, last December, you remember there were the, the really cold weather that came down from the Arctic and covered most of, most of the country got below freezing or below zero temperatures. During that period, we came within, they, they've said, roughly 15 minutes of sections of the Northeast being without power. And if you get a cascading failure, it's not like you just turn the grid back on. It literally takes weeks to get these power stations back up and running. So imagine what would happen if New York City was without power for two weeks. Um, what would be the result of that? Uh, and and how many people would die? 
especially in the middle of a winter where the temperature is below zero. Uh, and there is no plan to deal with that. So um, so this is this is a big deal. Uh, and and people are beginning to go in this direction. Secondarily, the utilities are making it so difficult to work with them. We're getting very close to where it will be as economical to simply build your own system and not work with the utility. You know, just deal with a coupled system and say, hey, Mr. Utility, I don't need you. Anymore. You know, and and that's that's something. And when we start adding in microgrids, you know, where you might be in a neighborhood or a, a university, for example, that has an independent system, um, you know, so this is how we're changing. This is this is where we're moving. And you're right in the beginning age of this. Uh, for those of you who are thinking about um, solar as a career, um, to me, when I graduated from high school and went into college, it was right at the beginning of the personal computer revolution. And, and this is the age of, of S Steve Jobs and, and uh, Bill Gates and the idea that you can build your own system. This is the floppy disk age of solar. And you're right at the beginning of it. This is going to change everything for the next several decades. So uh, it's, a good, it's a good time to get involved. Um, I'll just show you, I think, some of the components here. Um, you can see that typically you're going to have a system on the roof. Uh, now where they're marketing us again, I'll See if I can just pause that. Ah, it keeps throwing these there. I'll play it. All right. So there's the system on the roof. There's a piece of electronics on the roof with that. And then it goes into your inverter. You've got to have some sort of battery interface and something to deal with the electronic version of it. So these systems are conceptually much, much simpler than the end phase system. But they're... Um, uh, one of the issues and one of the reasons why Enphase is actually taken over a certain amount of the um, market share is because Solar Edge started outsourcing a lot of their production and they outsourced it in, I think it was in Turkey and Romania, and they began having quality control issues and a lot of the inverters started failing. I have a friend who installed a solar edge system. He had to replace his inverter three times. Um, they they replace it. You know they'll they'll honor their warranty, but it's a pain in the butt. You know you've got to shut the thing down, and then you've got to swap it out, and then you've got to ship the unit back to them, and all of that. The other nice thing with Enphase is if you've got thirty panels, you've got thirty inverters. If one of them fails, you still have twenty nine of them that are working. So, so the downside is is minimized, um, and and I've I've found with end phase I've actually had two of my microinverters fail at our farm. Very simple. You just go into the website. You say, "Hey, this microinverter failed." You just click on it, and then they send you an email saying, "Yep, you're right. It failed. We're shipping you a replacement. Uh, it should arrive in a couple of days." In the past, they said. Put it, put the old one in a box and ship it back to us. Now they say just throw it away. We don't care. You know they don't want it back. So, uh, so it's dead simple. And they send you a brand new one. So I'm hoping all forty of mine fail here soon because uh, I want I want brand new microinverters and and they're warranted for twenty five years. So uh, you know that's nice. Get a brand new microinverter at the end of your twenty five year period. Okay, so uh, hopefully I touched on those things. Anybody have any questions uh, from these? This gives you a little sense of what, what's going on with the industry here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, uh, Clark. Um, I think uh, you answered that question I was gonna ask about Australia. They have a micro grid system for when they build a new uh, development where all it goes into a shared battery bank. But I guess that you were you were talking about that for colleges. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, it's fairly common. Microgrids are are becoming a thing. Um, the military is very keen on this. Military bases, mm -hmm. forward deployment operations, things like that. They would like this to be, you know, independent. 
Um, so think of it like a computer network where you're networking your computer and you're only going outside that network for capacity over under kind of stuff. You know, if I need a little bit, I'll go outside that network. If I have a little bit extra, I'll send it outside this network. But most of it's going to be consumed within my network. Um, that's kind of it. I, I really think the the internet or the, the electrical grid of the future is going to be a lot of small microgrids, a lot of independent distributed energy systems, um, all interconnected together, a lot like the internet. You know, you've got a laptop, you've got a, a pad or whatever. It can do things independent, but a lot of the content you want is out there on the grid. Um, it's out there on in the net. So, so the utilities have to get out of the mindset that they're simply providing you with electricity because that's something you can provide for yourself. They have to give you something more. They need to somehow tap into the interconnectivity to provide you with benefit to connect to them. Otherwise you don't need them, you know, um, because I can, I can deal independently, but there is some things that they could do just like the internet um, that I can't do for myself. You know, I don't know what those things are. Um, security firms are, are dealing with this. They're saying, okay, if you log in, if you hook into our system, now we're gonna monitor your electric consumption. We're going to monitor your home. If there's a, a, an appliance that shows wear and tear based on its energy consumption, we're going to notify you and say, hey, your refrigerator is starting to wear out. You might want to consider replacing it. And here's an advertisement from some of our sponsors, you know, to uh, have you buy a new, um, or let's say you're on vacation um, and, and you have an electrical problem, your air conditioning goes out or or whatever or your pipes are beginning to freeze all of these things are are something that's an idea what about um you know battery charging can i apply the excess power from my home and use that when i'm in a different location to power my to charge my electric vehicle why couldn't i do that power goes on to the grid power comes off the grid now i just need to account for it somehow there could be services that will do that. Um, you know, these are the services that you'll have to come up with to make the next the next uh, group of billionaires, you know? I mean, when the internet first came out, nobody thought about Facebook, nobody thought about Google, nobody thought about these multi, multi-billion dollar companies. Well, now we're getting into the age where the electrical grid is a smart interconnected communication device. How are you going to monetize that? I don't know, but that's where the next stage of billionaires are going to come from. Is is that is making these things work? So I always tease me that AEP no longer just can provide me with electricity. They better give me Disney Plus, otherwise I'm not connecting to them. You know, they're gonna they're gonna come up with something. Anybody else have any questions? All right, so we'll get together in a week. In the meantime, I think it's chapter four, maybe, is for the next week. So uh, go through it. And if you have any questions in between these meetings, feel free to always just contact me. Uh, but then if you do have questions you want to hold for next meeting, that's good too. All right, so I'll see you guys next week. All right, take care.